These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythms, get down. We invite you to tap into this program that we had earlier this year, which featured a public lecture conversation with Professor Tom Porter, where we explored the rhythms of movement through a robust conversation that examined manifestations of the global dimensions of the Black freedom struggle. We paid specific attention to the impact of Black classical music as an amplifying influence of the ideas and trajectory of those engaged in struggle, particularly as they organized programs of freedom rooted in a specific conceptualization of human rights, which were and are directly related to the temporal conditions produced from various forms of colonialism, slavery, apartheid, Jim Crow, etc. In this conversation, we explored institution building, the road of black bookstores, black radicalism, critical knowledge production in, outside, and in spite of the academy. His crew of black organic intellectuals, Amir Baraka, Jack O'Dell, Robert Rhodes, Samir Amin, black internationalism, the role of black radical radio, Africa, black classical music, and much more. Professor Porter is the embodiment of the concept organizer intellectual, a former member of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, head of the King Center in Atlanta, former strategist and advisor to Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign, former director of Black Studies at Ohio University, dean at Antioch Graduate School in Washington, D.C., program director and longtime radio host, jazz critic, social political theorist, specifically Black radical thought, author and organizer. Professor Porter can be firmly placed in the tradition of Black organic intellectuals and political philosophers. We invite you to think with us, think through us, Think around us, but think nonetheless. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Enjoy the program. Peace and greetings, peace and greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, welcome to our program this evening. Tonight we will engage in an organic discussion around the rhythms of freedom, the rhythms of freedom, Africa and Black internationalism. Tonight we are in conversation with Tom Porter. Professor Porter is the embodiment of the concept of organizer intellectual a former member of CORE, the, the Congress of Radical e uh, Equality and SNCC, head of the King Center in Atlanta, former strategist and advisor to Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign, former chair of Black Studies, graduate director of Antioch Graduate Center in Washington, DC, program director and longtime radio host, jazz critic, sociopolitical theorist, specifically specializing in Black radical thought, and author, Honestly, the list goes on and on. 
Professor Porter can be firmly placed in the tradition of the Black organic intellectuals, the ones we read about, the ones we study, the ones we hear about, and political philosophy. Tom, welcome for joining. Thank you for joining us tonight. How are you doing? Uh, thanks for having me. No We're problem. We're finally getting it done. No problem. No problem. You know, uh, it, it's an absolute pleasure uh, for me to be having this conversation with you. You know, I've I've known you for for a pretty long time, um, actually, uh, having you know multiple multiple connections uh, through uh, some of you know a number of the folk that you have worked with over the years, a number of the people you have have mentored over the years, uh, you know some of the you know the experiences and things that you've shared over the years. Um, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you tonight, Tom. And I've been trying to, and I mentioned this to you. I've been trying to find an opportunity for you to engage, you know, our students in the community. Um, and also this is being uh, streamed live on YouTube around the world just to have this conversation so people can really understand, you know, some of the influences uh, that they hear in my in my work, in my teaching, but also the influences because you, you've influenced a lot of people. Um, and with that being said, as we begin this conversation, let's 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 begin this conversation by mapping your trajectory, mapping who you are, mapping how you developed your praxis, your theory, your praxis, understanding, you know, what we consider to be in our topic tonight, the rhythms of freedom. Tell us a little bit about Tom Porter. Well, like many uh, men and women of my generation, I uh, experienced a two state experience. I was born in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, my grandfather was a, a farmer and uh, had his own farm. And my father worked a farm, uh, met my mother, they got married and moved to Cincinnati when I was very, very young. But I spent a lot of my summers in, in, in Alabama. I was very, very fortunate. I was born into a family. Both of my my parents were active union members. So there was always some activity going on uh, in my house. Uh, both of them were active union members and, and involved the struggle uh, at many different levels. And having been born in, in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, my family was very much involved in the Montgomery bus boycott. And so that's kind of uh, been been with me most of my, my life. Growing up in Cincinnati was a very interesting experience. Cincinnati was well known for its educational system so that many uh, black men and women beginning after the Civil War sent their kids to Cincinnati to be educated. So I grew up in grew up in that kind of background, but I also grew up in a community which was a strong black community. And so all of the people that I saw, even though segregation existed, all of the significant people that I saw for the most part were black people, black librarians, black heads of the YMCA. And so I grew up in a very, very nurturing uh, community and in Cincinnati, Ohio called the West End, which was the largest black community uh, in Cincinnati. And up until a couple of years ago, every year they had what was known as the West End Dance. And we'd come back from wherever we were in the world uh, to Cincinnati the first weekend in December. So I kind of grew up in that kind of uh, background. I joined the Navy when I was 17 years old, which is a, a very, very good experience for me because for the first time I met young black men and some women from all over the world. And it was amazing how bright and smart uh, uh, we were. And of course, uh, the Navy was still, the military was still segregated for the most part. And um, there were a lot of activities that we engaged in. This was the, this was the late fifties. And uh, uh, I was stationed in a little town called Milton, Florida and the biggest uh, place to go for recreation was Pensacola, Florida. And uh, there were a number of activities that we had to engage in just to protect ourselves. And uh, 
but but also when I was in the Navy, there wasn't really that much to do. And so I gave myself various projects uh, while I was in the Navy. I would decide that I'm going to read, for instance, about all the great religions in the world. Then I'm going to study the books written by about all of the great women in the world, Madame Bovary, Tess of Durvilles, you know, and but I, I, I would do that, you know, and uh, I've always had a rebellious uh, side of me and a Catholic chaplain in, in, on the base, he had a list of books called Suggested Officers Reading. And I was an enlisted man and I would go and check books out of that section. There wasn't anything in it of note but he would turn red as a beat. <laughs> and he was, a, he was a Catholic chaplain. So uh, all while I was in the military 57 to 60, and I got out, decided that uh, I would go to college. The first college I went to was OU and Ohio University, which is very interesting because on registration day, this was 1960, that when you came out of the library, there were all of these tables set up with different political groups. So the Communist Party had a table, the Socialist Party. So this 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 was a time when stuff started heating up, and um, I got involved. I I went to uh, I transferred to the University of Cincinnati because I need to get a job, and so I worked nights at the post office went to school full time during the day in the post office. The post office in the civil rights movement was, was my school, the greatest source of my education. Because in the post office, it was called the graveyard of black ambition. And the reason why it was called that, because black men and women who had gone to college and university, mostly black colleges and universities, in science and, and other fields, could not get jobs. And so uh, among the petty bourgeoisie, they like to say that, uh, that a Morehouse man and a Spelman woman is a marriage made in heaven. In a working class community, a post office worker and a school teacher is a marriage made in heaven. And so, uh, but, but because they had all these brilliant black men and women in the post office, uh, there was an authority in the post office on everything. And, and these men and women were brilliant and they were always, they would call it a day drop in science. I remember a guy telling me, an older guy in the post office, he told me, he said, uh, young man, it's a skill game and a fool can't play it. And I still remember that to this day, you know? Uh, so, and then I got involved in uh, the Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, Cincinnati had a chapter, and uh, at, at, at some point, uh, I became chairman of Cincinnati Corps. And uh, in 1964, Roy Ennis, there's a lot of history that's not talked about. When people talk about the civil rights movement, they tend to talk about uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and SCLC. Well, CORE was started in 1941, so it was older than all of those organizations. But the, in 1964, Roy Ennis and a bunch of right-wing Negroes, and this was in 1964, at the CORE convention in Kansas City, and I was there. And they, they expelled all of the radicals including Julius Hobson from Cincinnati, who hated the statehood party, I mean, from DC. They expelled all of the radicals. As, as we came back from Kansas City in the car, there were four or five of us, and we started discussing what we're going to do because we, we didn't want to be a part of that. And at that time, SNCC was beginning to uh, organize in the North. And so, like many Northern core, core chapters, we became affiliates of SNCC. And that was at the same time that the leadership had passed to Stokely Carmichael and the crew from Howard University, Charlie Cobb, uh, Ralph Featherstone, it was DC. So there, at, at that same time, there was a switch in SNCC and we were moving 
to the black power phase of the movement. And, um, uh, and, and I spent, at the same time, I'm going to college. And at the same time, I was married when I was a sophomore in college. <laughs> and uh, my daughter was born, and one of my daughters was born uh, the day that I finished undergraduate school. And so that's the other thing that people really don't, that people today, young people, they don't understand. That I didn't get paid for being chairman of court. I didn't get paid. I mean, you, you, you did that because you believed in it. So that was, uh, and, and I, I remain active uh, in, 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 in SNCC, uh, engaged in a lot of, uh, lot of different activities. And of course, uh, when, when, when Black Power, there were a lot of different things going on in the, in the Black community. That's why I'm taking, taking my time to say certain things because we really need to have a comprehensive picture, I think, of what the movement was all about. There's a tendency to think that the movement only took place in the South. But there were movements, like I said, Core started in 1941 in Chicago. So there were movements in Detroit, uh, the rent strikes in Harlem. Uh, uh, there were movements in Newark. I mean, there used to be black arts conventions that took place in Detroit. That was in the 60s. I met a Mary Baraka, Ms. Leroy Jones, in Detroit in 1967. So that, and these were big, big meetings and what have you. So uh, Black Power was a rallying cry, but just like I tell people about Black Lives Matter, once you put it out there, you don't control it. So uh, because the only reason why it catches on is that it was in the air to begin with that people were ready for it. People were, we were tired of, of basically the non, the non-violent approach. It didn't mean that we were advocating violence, but it meant that the question of power and, uh, and the need for power, the power to define who we were. And there were big discussions about, are well, we Negroes? Black African Americans, there were serious discussions. I can I can remember sitting up at night at the university discussing the notion of the invisibility and the and and, and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. So when a time comes and there's a time in our struggle, even if they hadn't said Black Lives Matter, black people have these what I call, oh, hell no moment. I mean, George Floyd was one of the, oh, hell no, we, that's just too much. And so if you notice about at the time that Black Power became a rallying cry, there were serious rebellions across the country because, and they all started for the most part when the police were doing what they normally did and they, they went too far in the minds of people. So there was this, oh, hell no moment. And so they've had these, oh hell, mo oh, hell no moments. And we can see it now that the community is saying, oh, hell no. And uh, that's kind of the, I can't say that's the movement side of me because I never left the movement. <laughs> every, every job that I had, uh, for the most part, which the job was that came to me. Uh, for instance, I became Dean of African American Studies because the Dean resigned and there was a, quad, a cadre of radical socialists. And uh, they said, man, why don't you come out here? Uh, and, and I went out there first as a visiting professor to take the place of Lyndon Wade Pettiford, who became for a minute, the ambassador to the United States for the ANC for South Africa, but she was teaching at OU. And then I, I became, I was known for somebody who could go to meetings and do budgets and what have you, you know. We, we like the sexy side of, of the revolution, but the serious work, 
to those budgets, ordering, yeah. or, or putting so everything together. I had, that, I had that, you know, that reputation. I was radical enough. So that's how I became a Dean of African American Studies. But before that, I was a graduate student at Antioch. You know, there are times in the movement where you have to make a move because the heat is on. And uh, it was time for me to leave Cincinnati. I was, the kind of confrontations that I was getting in, um, you know, I, 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 I could be a hero, but uh, I've been a dead hero. So uh, I, I enrolled in the Antioch Graduate School. At that time, they had a group of radical students there and, uh, and, and I got involved and I'm still involved in SNCC. So I'm still organizing students at Central State, Wilberforce, uh, uh, and Antioch. So this was a graduate program and they were training teachers, teachers to infiltrate the inner city. And, uh, so we were a bunch of black students and we could see the contradictions that they were setting up because you could get a master's degree in 12 to 15 months. And they had all of these young, young white students who had been in the Peace Corps who would get a master's and then be positioned to become assistant principals and principals in inner city schools. And uh, we had one of those oh hell moments. So no, that ain't right. And so I became the director of Antioch's graduate program as a, result, as a result of student struggle. And it, it, it eventually became known as the Horace Mann Bond Center of Education. And uh, we had as members of the faculty, Bob Rhodes, Jack O'Dell, Tony Montero, uh, Mary Terrell. I mean, it was, uh, and, and, and we were crazy enough to think that we could use a socialist model of education to train teachers. Now it worked because our students became principals, doctors, and lawyers and what have you. And you had to take methods of thought, political economy, and, 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 and all of that, so it worked. Uh, but the federal government didn't like it. So same thing happened with the King Center. I went down to do one thing and ended up being the executive director of the King Center. And, you know, I could talk in details about all those things. So that's kind of, that's kind of been my life, and you know, I'm 82 now, so, so, I, I I'm still involved, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I certainly it's an honor for me to be here, and 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 talk, but that's kind of a thumb thumb shell. In the mean, well, I was always involved with music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we we're going we're going to get to that. I I just want to you you said so many different things in that particular moment. I wanted to whack it, and I really appreciate that because what what you just displayed is is the multifaceted uh, 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 area, the the multiple ways within which people were understanding how to struggle and the need to struggle. And I wanted to back up, uh, particularly when you were talking about, you know, SNCC as when when, when uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, takes over SNCC, there's a transition in happening, not only in SNCC itself with those young folk, but also in the context of the communities around it. Uh, that's important as well. And you also talked about, you mentioned the Black Arts Movement, you mentioned your good friend, um, Amiri Baraka, and you, and I wanna back up to the point when you became the director of Black Studies uh, at uh, this is at Ohio, Ohio, Ohio University. University. Right. Uh, talk about the environment at that particular time. Talk about the study groups, uh, the, the the engagement uh, to with the community, and and why people thought that they needed you to be the director of that particular program, and your understanding of the the mix between Black power, Black arts and also black studies, because you were in that nexus right there. Well, one, one of the essential ingredients of us in the civil rights movement is very, very interesting because the young, young people, when we were young, we represented, because there's a tendency for people to think that the radicals were not necessarily intellectuals or educated, just radical. Uh, 
nothing could be further from the truth. Stokely Carmichael graduated from Bronx Science in New York, which at that time was the number one ranked public high school in the country. I'm an alumnus and graduate of Wallen Hills High School, which was number two in the country at that time. So uh, we were not dummies by any means. And so one of the essential ingredients of the movement, even in the early days of SNCC, was reading and studying, whether it was France Fanon, Regis Debray, uh, uh, Che Guevara, I mean, but we studied and discussed it, you know? And then there were people like, uh, why am I blocking on his name? Jim Foreman, whose book, The Making of a Black Revolutionary, actually in my mind was the first person to bring revolutionary thought uh, into the movement. So when I became Dean, of African-American studies, I had been involved. Antioch had one of the, if not first or second, black studies program in the country. And Ohio University maybe had the third. And so I had been involved in my sneak work with students uh, at these two schools. And Antioch was very famous. They had an all black dorm. And um, Kenneth Clark, who was on the board, obviously opposed it. But they also had, uh, th there were faculty members who traveled from campus to campus, kind of like circuit. And Bob Rhodes was one of those. Bob Rhodes is a person that most people never heard of. And most people don't know anything about him. Bob Rhodes is the, is the, the smartest person I ever met in my life, Bob Rhodes. I vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he and Tony Montero, Harold Rogers, they would go between Ohio, Ohio University and Antioch. And then when we, when I became director of the graduate program and we, we didn't make any bones about it. Our orientation was towards socialism. Uh, and we saw that, that you could use, I mean, the thing about, the thing about socialism, oh, if you think about, if you think about socialism, you think about Karl Marx. And uh, the most important thing about the science of society it's understanding that there are laws of social development, there are laws of thought, and you can learn these things and apply them to concrete situations. And so we studied this stuff, the history of philosophy uh, and what have you. So by the time I got involved with the graduate program, Ohio University, had two students who were members of A and C who were on the faculty. And 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 Lenny Ways I said went back. And um, black studies, there's always a struggle around black studies. Black studies essentially was started by students, young people in the movement, not by the professional black faculty members came later. Uh, and so it was, uh, I mean, we were young and, uh, and excited about what we're doing. We actually thought that we, we would be able to overthrow this thing. <laughs> so, so, but at the same time, there was so much going on in the arts, in the culture, in the politics and what have you. So it was a very, very exciting, very exciting time to, to be involved in, and to be involved with people who are talking about methods of thought, that there are different ways of looking at social reality. We are listening to a program that was held earlier this year with Professor Tom Porter. 
This was a public lecture conversation where we explored the rhythms of movement through a robust conversation that examined manifestations of the global dimensions of the black freedom struggle. We paid specific attention to the impact of black classical music as an amplifying influence of the ideas and trajectory of those engaged in struggle, particularly as they organized programs of freedom rooted in a specific conceptualization of human rights, which were and are directly related to the temporal conditions produced from various forms of colonialism, slavery, apartheid, Jim Crow, etc. Professor Porter is the embodiment of the concept organizer intellectual, a former member of CORE, SNCC, head of the King Center in Atlanta, former strategist and advisor to Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign, former director of Black Studies at Ohio University, dean at Antioch Graduate Center in Washington, D.C., program director and longtime radio host, jazz critic, sociopolitical theorist, specifically Black radical thought, author and organizer. We invite you to think with us, think through us, think around us, but think nonetheless. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Continue to enjoy the program. of thought, that there are different ways of looking at social re reality, uh, political economy, not political science, but political economy. But, you know, uh, and these are young people. Some of the earliest faculty members in Black studies were students themselves who stayed to really make sure that the program was what it should be. So it, it was, it was, uh, very exciting. We turn out a lot of good students who are doing good things in the world, but Black Studies was always under attack. It was always under attack. I mean, Black Studies was something that the state agreed to, but didn't want to. So after they agreed to it, it almost, I mean, I walked around the campus and invariably some white faculty member would say, would say to me, do you think we really need black studies? You know, and so it was always under attack. And, and what eventually happened to black studies, we can see, and this is something that we may be able to get into a little bit later, that what happened to black studies? Why did black studies cease to be for the most part, um, uh, a place where students got a great education were radicalized. And it had to do with, uh, there were a lot of people who came to the country and they became the, the choice of the establishments. And some of them were from the Caribbean, some of them were from Africa. And we see the same thing happening in, in, in the country now, who come here to engage in capitalism. And so there was, in many cases, no real commitment to Black studies and no real commitment to the history of Black people. And so eventually, these programs became marginalized and for the most part, really don't exist, uh, in my mind, as, 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 as a real place of radical thought and what have you. Although there are a lot of PhDs a lot of bright people out there, a lot of people writing and what have you, and I don't put that down. But uh, that, I, I don't know of a Black Studies program that, because I haven't kept up, that I would call a serious Black Studies program. There's some people doing serious work. And, and I, wanted to, I wanted to chime in here because, yes, we do want to get to that question of what happened to Black Studies. Uh, but, you know, that when you talk about seriousness and one of the things that I look at, particularly when you're talking about black studies is the fact that uh, the connection with the community, because again, it's very, very important to understand when you're talking about black studies as a, as a intellectual formation that was already formed in the communities and being brought onto the campus. So when you say, and I want to make sure that, you know, uh, folk who are attending here tonight. So when you're saying 
you know, this, this, this having this question of what happened to black studies, but also uh, substantive black studies. Are you, are you targeting the fact that many of these particular programs have professionalized themselves away from community and struggle in the community as well? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, the issue of becoming tenured and, um, and, um, Publisher Perry, I mean, people got caught up in that. Getting, I mean, you know, I don't have a PhD. I've had every opportunity to work on one. I was admitted to University of Cincinnati, first black to admitted to the PhD program. So it's not that uh, I haven't had an opportunity. I was just too busy uh, to really deal with that. I don't, I don't really put that down, but. That, I mean, I was a tenured faculty member at Ohio University and I left because I was, it was just unconnected to the community. I mean, I left. I was a tenured faculty member. I could have stayed out there. You, the, uh, and once the professional faculty people came in, the issues changed. It was no longer the issue of really educating students, of really connecting black, keeping black studies connected to the community where it come from. Uh, and to become professionals and perform professional associations and write endless books and papers and what have you. And some of them are great. Most of them are, uh, <laughs> hardly get read by people outside of the academy. Uh, so black, black, but that happened in every phase of our lives, the political lives, the, the black caucus and the people who organized the Gary Convention are altogether different than these people in the Black Caucus today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, all of that happened as a result of the intrigue of the state in league with professional Blacks who wanted to become professional Blacks. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Gary, and I actually wrote a note to talk about Gary, uh, you know, Gary, Indiana. They uh, uh, talk about, you know, link what you're saying in the context of this, this contestation between the professionalization of, so, you know, education and Black folk being in education and what was happening at the time, you know, with Gary and in Gary, Indiana. Like, what, what, what was that like? I mean, again, everybody's coming together to develop a platform, a black agenda, so to speak. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some of, some of your work around that and other people that you were involved with, uh, you know, in that particular uh, endeavor? Well, at the time of the Gary Convention, I was executive director of Kingston, Atlanta. And so I attended the convention with Mrs. King and other members of the staff. 1972, Dick Hatcher was the mayor of Gary, Indiana, but he was also, I think, vice, vice chairman of the Democratic Party. And you had a strong Black Caucus, a Black Caucus that was concerned not only about the national struggle, but the international struggle. Charlie Diggs, who was one of the co veners out of Detroit, was a real authority on struggle in Africa and pushing that agenda into Congress. Amiri Baraka, who was, there were three con conveners, Mary Baraka, Charlie Diggs, and Dick Hatcher, who were president. And again, it was an idea that starts in the streets, people talking about what we need, what we need. And so, uh, this notion of a black convention uh, was something that was out there, but it was a time when pieces fell in place. Dick Hatcher was vice president of the Democratic Party, but also Gary, but also he was mayor of Gary, Indiana. And as mayor, Jesse Jackson could have run for president, but he could not have run for president in the way that he ran and, and the way that he announced it, it were not for the fact that Mayor Marion Berry was the mayor of DC. So he could give him the convention center. There were certain resources. And so although Gary, Indiana was a small city, 
by city standards, Dick Hatcher had certain resources and you need to be able to have buildings and schools where you can have meetings and, and what have you, when you control the police force and what have you. And so uh, the elements came together uh, uh, at that time. And I mean, uh, Amiri Baraka, who had always been a force uh, uh, in the culture and nationalist community, then in the nationalist community, revolutionary nationalist community. And at the time that he death, he was openly saying that he was a communist. So, but he had always been organizing. He had always been respected as an organizer. He commanded great respect so that all of those things uh, came together at the same time that, that with the assassinations of Martin and Malcolm and other lesser assassinations of black people across the country, there was also this sense that we needed to move our struggle on another level. And so that was Gary. And if you if you have not read the agenda that came out of Gary, it is a blueprint. There has not been an agenda in the black community that that measures up to the agenda that came out of Gary. It's not to say that it does not to be refined, but it's certainly a good framework to discuss the issues that that involve the entire African world. And and to talk about that, you're also talking about the fact that if we want to put some language on this, is that when you talked about uh, you know developing at Antioch uh, a multidisciplinary way of addressing Black folk, this is also in a tradition or a genealogy or a legacy of of Black folk who were resisting using radical uh, uh, ideas and thoughts to really mold an agenda, which brings everybody to Gary, Indiana at that particular point in time. And speaking of that, and I wanted to kind of pull on this, you mentioned Bob Rhodes and, you know, of, of course, I'm, I'm, I came to know Bob Rhodes through you, but also the fact that you convened at Antioch a, 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 a uh, 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 all-star knowledge production cast of people, because not only did you have uh, Bob Rhodes there, you also had Jack O'Dell. Jack O'Dell, could you talk a little? And let me and let me also make this point. I want this to be on record. We talk about intelligent people, but you have to be clear about people who bring intelligent people together. So there has to be a level of intelligence to bring people together on par to understanding how knowledge is produced, particularly these, I mean, Jack O'Dell, uh, Robert Rhodes, and, and you talked about uh, uh, Tony Montero. Could you talk a little bit about this? Is, and, and doing Antioch was obviously, this was after the, uh, the, the convention, correct? This is, right. you know, talk a little well, no, bit. No, it was, yeah, it was, it was uh, let's see, 72, yeah, it was after. Yeah, so talk about how you are looking at this, you and the, and the crew and the, and, and the folk you're running with, you're looking at this and carrying this agenda even after that, even, you know, developing and understanding that we need to train folk to get into the community. We need to train folk to get into the universities. And you're doing that at the same time. It's not just stay in a university. You guys are training folk to do both at the same time to constantly, you know, push this 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 agenda, or push it to its to its inevitable conclusion. If there was a conclusion, if there is a conclusion. You know, when, when when our students who came through the Antioch Graduate School of Education, which also had an undergraduate component, and one time I was head of the undergraduate component as well as the graduate component, students refer not to, they don't refer to it as Antioch Graduate School of Education, they say the center. And our students, people who came through that, even today, today I talked to Grossbeck Parham, who was a student at Antioch, uh, was my assistant for a while. He is now working in Zambia on cervical cancer in African women, and is known the world over, including at the World Health Organization, where he co-chairs a commission uh, on cervical cancer. And these are the kind of students 
that came out. Mary Terrell became a judge, uh, but all of them stayed rooted. And that was because of the presence of, of involved intellectuals like Jack O'Dell or Bob Rhodes. I mean, if you can, well, most people never knew Bob Rhodes, but I had the pleasure of having lunch on a regular basis with Bob Rhodes and Jack O'Dell. Jack O'Dell was called by J. Edgar Hoover the most dangerous man in America because of his influence on Dr. Martin Luther King. Jack was a, a leading strategist, not, not just in the black movement, but in the world movement and, you know, sane freeze. Jack was uh, responsible for my meeting Yasser Arafat. <laughs> Jack was responsible for me going to a lot of places around the world that I've never, through his connections and contacts. But he was, uh, do yourself a favor. Jack has, uh, he was an authority on what he called a special variety of colonialism, the black condition in America. So you should read his stuff in Freedom Ways where he was an associate editor and, uh, I remember early on at Antioch, some of the uh, white students were concerned that Jack didn't have a degree. And they actually rebelled and uh, came to me and I said, if Jack does get a degree, I'm gonna fire him. I mean, here you have a man who uh, uh, had been a merchant seaman. I mean, Jack was uh, one of the most brilliant strategists, political strategists, and he's not only was the influential around Dr. King, but he was also the person more than anybody who took Jesse from being a country preacher to being a person who began to think about larger issues. You know, just every day having lunch with Bob Rhodes and Jack O'Dell, and the two of them were constantly challenging each other. So it was like being on the basketball court with LeBron James and Michael Jordan, you know, and and I would just I would just listen, and uh, and I used to say to myself, I'm sure that they're, they're saying that this in this discussion he's not in it, and I would laugh and say, but guess what, I'm the one that's, that's signing the paychecks, but we had a good crew, and we were very very influential in the politics of DC and the politics of the overall movement. At, 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 for one of the peace movements, we were at peace, peace marches, we were the center uh, here in DC. And we had people coming through lecturing like John Henry Clark, uh, Horace Mann Bond. I mean, the people who came through lecturing were well, who's who of that generation of black intellectuals. And so to expose students uh, to dialectical and historical materialism, to teach a course like Methods of Thought where you deal with the history of thought. Um, and um, and you, know, you, you have students who never thought they would read Hegel or Marx uh, or Fernand, you know, and so taking these students, what we found is that if given a scientific approach to looking at the world, it is amazing what you can do with that. Whether you go to law school or medical school, it, it, it is amazing just by looking, having another way of looking at the world and understanding that just like there are laws of physics and laws of biology, they're laws of thought. And and their laws of social development, how societies develop over time. And when you're exposed, see the, the, the danger, the, the fear of communism or Marxism is not a fear of the ideology. It's a fear. Marx analyzed capitalism better than anybody in the entire world to this day but he did it with his method of approach. 
his method of approach. And so his method of thought, I mean, Marx was not an authority on communism. It didn't really exist other than theoretically. You'd have to get to Lenin before you got to that, a real authority on that. But he was an authority uh, on capitalism, of capitalist development, uh, on methods of thought. And so when you expose, and you know, you say, why are you talking about that? Well, it is amazing because most of the people who I respected were people like Paul Robeson or Du Bois, or Oliver Cox, these great black intellectuals were people who had no problem with that. And so um, uh, it, it, it was an exciting, in fact, we, we're going to have a, uh, a reunion of the, of the center uh, this coming spring, if we can pull it off, of all, all of our students. Oh my so. goodness. I, I definitely would love to be <laughs> to be um in in in, in that uh, I, I wanted I wanted to I wanted to tease something out. I cannot let this slide because something that you just said, and I want to make sure that we 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 tease this out. You just said a very, very important uh a, a thought um in the context of 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 Marx and and and, and communism and socialism. You said it's it, it, tease that out it, or, or expand upon or expound upon the notion that you just said it's not the ideology they're scared of it's the actual working process that it is scared if you're moving in this direction the scientific process then you're going to follow then that will also follow a conclusion so if you are are are, are disrupting who controls the means of production then what you're doing is actually going to lay out a certain level of thought that will follow and and actions will follow after that talk a little bit about that i can't let that slide because it was a very important point that i wanted to kind of tease out of what you just well, said well cuba is a good example how you could take a poor country of uh, people who were in many cases uh semi-illiterate uh for the most part it was a backward country and I remember meeting a woman from Cuba who said, before the revolution, I couldn't read and write, and now I have a PhD. I remember Fidel speaking, said, you may find some students in Cuba who don't have all of the clothes that they need, but you would not find a Cuba who does a student, a young person in Cuba who doesn't have pen and paper. And so by using the scientific method of what we call the science of society, that Cuba was able to, to turn around an entire society and for its size to be a world leader. And if it were not for the blockade and the sanctions on Cuba, it would rival the United States in many ways, even though it's a very, very small country. And so that's the power uh, of the thought, but they, it's, it's, it's like I'm amazed that when even watching this stuff about Putin and all this stuff that's going on, and it's so historical, uh, ahistorical. For instance, the West has more troops closer to Russia than Russia has troops closer to Ukraine. You know, you can you can go and see it on the map. At 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 the same time, the West was not happy until it was it was it succeeded in getting leaders in the Soviet Union who would undermine. And of course, there were problems in the Soviet Union. Uh, they were not happy until that happened, and now they've created a whole bunch of many states where there used to be states at the same time it's like russia and china they forget that in world war ii the soviet union united states and great britain were allies i heard a, a commentator say today that uh that churchill and roosevelt never trusted stalin it's really the other way around. 
Roosevelt and Churchill, and you can read the correspondence between Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin. Roosevelt and Churchill thought that Hitler, Hitler, remember that when, by the time that Hitler got to the Soviet Union, France had a, 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 a fascist government, the Vichy, pulling all of these places were under fascist leadership. Their theory was, is that Hitler would be weakened when he defeated the Russians. And then he would, they could take care of him. But the opposite happened. The Russians defeated Hitler. And Stalin and the Soviet Union started moving east. And, and all of these countries were freed from fascism and some of them probably became social and communist too fast. But the point of it is, if it were not for the Soviet Union, NATO probably wouldn't exist. If it were not for the role. You know, but I'm looking at this. I, I, I can remember being a student in high school when Taiwan was considered China. And the seat at the, United, at the U, UN was held by China, uh, I mean by Taiwan, when one fourth of the world's people that existed in China did not exist. So we used to get this weekly reader every week when I was in high school and referred to China as Red China. And China, Taiwan, which was the place that the United States set up with Chiang Kai-shek, who was defeated by Mao Zedong and who was ruthless. So. So when, 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 when you look at, at the world and what you see in the world today, it is not the world. I mean, if you don't like communism, you don't like it. You know, I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, if you don't, I mean, but the point of it is, if you can learn how to think, you can solve problems. You don't have to become a communist or a socialist, but if you know how to think, and chances are, if you go through struggle, there's a certain point in struggle when, and I hope we get a chance to talk about internationalism, because there's a certain point where we have to realize in this country that we, our problems cannot be solved in the framework, in the political, economic, social framework of the United States. And that is a real issue the internationalization of our struggle, not just the black struggle here, but the struggle in Africa, the struggle of black people all, all over the world, throughout the diaspora, cannot be solved within the confines or framework of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you actually we we are there we at that we're at that transition point particularly to to look at to look at this work because. There's an internationalist, uh, what we consider to be a black internationalist uh, perspective uh, in all of the work that you engaged in, even as far back uh, as you mentioned uh, your, your, your parents being labor and labor organizing. Uh, there, was a, there was a clear uh, uh, internationalist perspective. And let's talk about that a little bit, because one of the things that you talked about was capitalist development. You looked at this notion uh, that Jack O'Dell talked about in um, in a lot of his writings in Freedom Ways, uh, the special variety of colonialism. But also, you know, you introduce a lot of folk here in D.C. on your radio program to Samir Amin. Uh, used to have him on the program. Could you talk a little bit about, expand upon this internationalist uh, 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 perspective that was clear in the work of folk that they considered to be radical. Black folk who were organizing, they considered them the avant-garde, the, the, the ones who were radical. So they, when I mean by they, the mainstream leadership, the dominant discourse uh, were, were really marginalizing that question that actually goes back to the boys being kicked out of the uh, uh, NAACP for the second time. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that internationalist uh, perspective as a foundation, as a foundational framework? Can you Im imagine a world, an African world, the continent of Africa, if Emil Carr Cabral was still alive, 
if Patrice Lumumba was still alive, if Samara Michelle was still alive, if Eduardo Mulaney was still alive, if Chris Honey was still alive, if Stephen, but these are all young people who were assassinated with the exception of Samara Michelle by Western imperialism. Could, could you, can you, you would not have an Africa today that did not understand the importance of having a United States of Africa, of having one Africa instead of a whole bunch of many states was set up by their oppressors and they're still begging the same people who oppress them. Imagine, imagine a world if Dr. King and Malcolm were still alive. And if all of the Fred Hamptons uh, were still alive and out of jail, imagine. Uh, and you could go to all of the countries where there are people of African descent. There would be, we would have a different world. I mean, the Bandung Conference was a coming together of people of color. When Du Bois talked the problem of the color line, he was not just talking about black people. He was talking about colored people of the world. And the Bandung Conference was a conference of radical leaders from Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And so if you can imagine a world of these people were still, imagine a world if John Coltrane was alive, who died 39 or 40, or Eric Dolphy, or Booker Little, or Minnie Ripperton of Curtis Mayfield. Imagine that. And so you, 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 you know, I mean, you can imagine a world of internationalism. You could, I mean, when, 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 when Duke Ellington talks about a new world of coming, he wasn't just talking about a new world of coming for black people. And, and we have, so this, this internationalism, internationalism has always been a part of our struggle. I mean, we would listen to uh, Terry Collier early, you know, you know, earlier, you know, that's a song about not only the enslavement of black people, but what happens when you enslave people, take away their name, <laughs> you know, take away their history. I mean, j just recently I had to stay in the hospital and many of the nurses were from Africa, many of the, 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 a lot of the personnel was from Africa. And one of the things that I realized about most of them, that they began the understanding of their history with colonialism and neo-colonialism. And when black people say we come a long way, that's from slavery. There's no conception, real conception of before slavery. And, and so, when you talk about Nkrumah and all of all of that whole generation of leaders, if if I mean Cabral's return to the source, I think it's it 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 it, it, it is must reading. And so, so this internationalism has always been there, but there's also a tendency within our community. Dr. King came out against the war with black leadership that said he shouldn't do that. He should not. He should not mix our struggle with the war. They denounced him. Uh, Malcolm is very clear about internationalism, although people try to freeze him in time and not where Malcolm went and where he was going. So this, this internationalism is not anything new. I mean, Du Bois did, did the first Pan-African Congress uh, in, in, in London, I believe. And so this, it's not new, but what is new is that we have a, a generation now where Al Sharpton is a titular leader of black people. Where you can have a guy go from a snitch and take the place of Dr. King or Malcolm. You know, and, and he will never bring up the need to internationalize our struggle. It doesn't really matter if a black woman gets on the Supreme Court. She'll still be in a minority. It'll be good 
And so if you're thinking about taking your struggle, I struggle to the Supreme Court, you got nothing coming. And that is why there's always been this thrust to internationalize our struggle, to unite not only people of African descent, but the oppressed people around the world, whether in Asia, Latin America, Africa. And one of the things that you learn as you travel the world and inter interact with people, you realize just like you see in the West, they'll have a meeting, the World Economic Forum or what have you. But there are other meetings where people who think differently meet too. And so there's a whole world of, uh, 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 somebody asked me, who's the greatest person that I ever met in my life? And I said, Fidel Castro. <laughs> He's the most, and that I've met a person. Um, and uh, I mean, I've met Yasser Arafat and, and a lot of people. But the point of it is, when you see the connection of people, it's not only the colored people of the world, but it's also a common oppression and a common oppressor. And that cannot be solved unless the struggles are internationalized. Mm -hmm. and, and let's pick back, let's pick up on that. Let's let's dig a little bit more deeper uh, uh, in the, uh, on this notion of the African world, looking at the African continent, because, but we wanna do this through uh, the influence of Africa and Black classical music, and I'm using that term because, again, this is what you know. This is a term that you you, you know you and other folk, uh, you know, uh, who AKA jazz artists uh, like to use in the context. Let's talk about Africa and its influence through Black classical music and its relationship to the movement itself. Because you mentioned, again, Terry Collier, we opened up with that particular song. Of course, we know Coltrane. Talk about this, this, this notion of free jazz that they call it, this notion of Africa inter intersecting into movement and the work that people are engaged in as we are moving through Black Power era, through, you know, Black arts, you know, all of the other, other particular stuff. And then we'll, we'll, we'll critique that as well and, and look at why it's missing today. Well, the, the influence of Africa on, on African culture in America is very easy to understand because we were not brought here as Negroes or Black Americans. We were brought here as Africans. Slavery involved Africans. And the early the earliest music in this country of black people was African music. And if you were, if you've lived long enough, you know, I'm 82 years old and I can remember a couple of times in Alabama when I was very little kid, not, you know, in elementary school. And I went out in the woods to one of these big camp meetings where you had, um, people singing in a way in, in, in a way that you've never heard before. And so the music, the, the thing about music, oppressed people begin to, as Cabral says, says it much better than I can that culture is a, I mean, uh, culture is a product of history and a determinant of history. And so music was the earliest form in which Africans on this side were able to communicate with each other because there were only certain things that the oppressor allowed. One was, one was praying and the other was music. And so that the music of oppressed people, whether it's, whether it's, Asian Latin America, it is as Capral said, it is a product of history, but it's also a determinant of history. And so uh, this music 
this progressiveness in black people because we have been at war ever since we've been here. So um, Duke Ellington said that his, his goal was to document the history of his people through music. And you can get a whole history lesson by just listening to Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington did suites on every place, many places that he traveled in the world, the Afro-Eurasian suite, the Togo Bravo suite, the Virgin Islands suite, the Afro-Eurasian, it's Duke Ellington. And so, uh, but this has always been, you know, it's interesting because Ellington and Count Basie and Fletcher Henderson, those big bands, they were not called big bands. They were referred to as the Ellington Organization, the Henderson Organization, the Basie Organization. And I remember I was talking with a, a man who I met at the bus stop, never saw him again. We were talking about music. And he said that Duke Ellington's orchestra was mass unity on a concert stage. And so this, this, this notion of music, uh, I mean, now we have what's called free music. And uh, Chico Freeman, Chico Freeman, who's a tenor saxophone player, he said one time, the only time he plays free is when he don't get paid. So, 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 because the music develops. I mean, uh, Coltrane, who many people see as far out, the epitome of a free musician, Coltrane played in Big Maybell's band. You hear that song, Candy. Coltrane, he played in Eddie Cleanhead Vincent's band. I mean, he went through all of the stuff. And so uh, it, 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 it evolves and it develops. And so, but that is true for, as we used to say, it's 360 degrees of black music. So uh, when you saw when you saw the Super Bowl, that represented 10 or 15 degrees of the 360 degrees of black music that was on that stage. It was an insult to black people, you know? Uh, it was an insult to Curtis Mayfield, insult to Marvin Gaye. I mean, they ain't in it. I mean, it, it, that, you know, the, the point of it is our music and our music also reflects different positions of black people. I mean, for instance, I never, after ours, which is made famous by Erskine Hawkins, he had a big band called the Alabama Collegians from Birmingham. After ours was considered by many black people the black national anthem. I mean, I did not really hear about lift up every voice and sing until I got to the East Coast. I, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but if you read or listen to Margaret Walker's For My People and tell me which one after you read that, you should think, you think would be a better national anthem. You see, so the music has always been, and, and, and because it was one of the things that we could do without the slave master of white people picking up on it. And so it's been, it's, it's been used to transmit messages. I mean, Billy Higgins, a world, world famous drummer, I was driving him back, he and Jackie McLean and Scotty Hope to the airport in Dayton, Ohio. And Billy Higgins said, Black people can play notes that white people can't even hear. Now you think about that. And I remember reading a book about New Orleans and it said that black people could pass a message from one end of New Orleans to the next and white people could never get it because it was done through the music. And so the, the, the music of oppressed people, of African people, and, and, and African music is not like Western music on the stage, African music and the music of, of most people, non-white people is an integral part of the community. 
takes from the cube community, gives leadership to the community. And the music is, there's no jazz, no R&B. There's music. There's, you know, we, we refer to jazz as black classical music because we don't like the fact that we don't like the word jazz. Most musicians don't like the word jazz. Mingus says it separates the black man from the money when you use that. So the, the, the point is about music and, and, and I understand free music and, and, and I like music, but you know, yesterday I was sitting uh, in my car while, in my daughter's car while she was in the store, she had the Bob Marley channel on. Man, I was listening to Bob Marley and I've told somebody before that, cause they know how much I love Coltrane. I said, man, you know, I love Bob Marley as much as I love Coltrane. <laughs> and Stevie Wonder too. And I mean, because they, 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 uh, we should, if we're gonna separate our music, we should separate it by what it represents in terms of us as a people. And that's why I say what happened at halftime at the uh, football Super Bowl was just a betrayal of everything in black music. You had a bunch of uh, rap artists who made reputations, many of them that by talking about killing cops who now play them on TV. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and the NBA, the entertainment wasn't much better. I mean, cause you, you gotta understand, I mean, they had Philip Bailey and Earth, Wind and Fire. Earth, Wind and Fire came out of a group called the Artistic, Artistic Heritage Ensemble out of Chicago, which was a, an organization of uh, a cultural organization. And uh, uh, Chaka Khan was in that band. But Earth, Wind and Fire, they were, the horns of Earth, Wind and Fire came out of Phil Karan's Artistic Heritage Ensemble. That's the whole history of, uh, when well you go and check out, Phil Karan was one of the founders of the AACM in Chicago. And so they separate. Philip Bailey can sing, but Earth, Wind and Fire was a very progressive, radical group both in terms of introducing African instruments because Phil Karan did that. So when you, you know, what they try to do and what every society does is to try and oppress people through their culture by separating their radical and progressive culture from the people and giving them some culture that has absolutely nothing to do with them. So I wanted to I wanted to come back because, of course, we, we, you know, those who know you do know your your deep uh, uh, knowledge and appreciation for uh, the cold trains. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, African African jazz artists. Let's talk about the influences of South African artists and 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 who who uh, are or why was that important and what was that exchange like? Uh, because when we think about uh, jazz. Most people just center it in here in the United States, even though th that is the case. But it also went, it was also a transmission, an interchange internationally uh, with, with a lot of artists on the continent itself. I'm thinking about Hugh Masekela, uh, 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 Dollar Brand, you know, those, those artists. Talk a little bit about, you know, that exchange uh, um, of, of, of music, particularly Black classical music on that particular level. You know, there, there, there is, and there's a tendency to say that most of the slaves who were brought here were from West Africa. And that's probably true. But if you've ever been to South Africa, that Blacks in South Africa are closest to Black Americans and most of the Africans in the big cities throughout the diaspora, whether it's Brazil, of Cuba, what have you. And that is because of the nature of work. South Africa is a highly industrialized, you know, place. And so South African music and South African musicians in particular have been, been very close to the development 
simultaneously as black music in this country. For instance, Kiffy Mukesi is considered to be the Charlie Parker of South Africa. So just like there's a Birdland in New York, there's a Kippies in South Africa. Then you got uh, Winston Monkunku is considered to be the John Coltrane of South Africa. But when you're in the streets, I mean, South Africa moves fast, just like if you were in New York or Detroit and, you, and you're walking down the street and and you speak to these brothers and say, sharp, 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 you know, it's that whole kind of rhythm. Uh, and so you have a, a, a kinship with, with black musicians, particularly with jazz in South Africa. But on the other hand, you also have in music, musicians coming out of places like Ghana and, and other places on the continent of Africa who are also playing what we consider advanced music because black people function at all levels of music. And Muhal Richard Avison told me one time, he said, you know, black people function at all levels of music. So you've got black musicians in Africa who place what they call so-called Western classical music. And if you want to check out Fela Sawande's African Suite, at the same time, you have William Curran Steele's African American Symphony. And so even on that side, we, wherever we are, our music, and we have to say that our music originated in Africa. I mean, if, if you want to say that your music originated in Mississippi, then that's on you, and, you know, but our music and the music of, of uh, the initial music of black people, when Du Bois talks about the sorrow songs, he's talking about Africans longing for their homeland. So it, it, it over historical time, they've tried to root out the advanced elements of black music, even in Africa, even, even in Africa. But the, I mean, You'd have to express, but there are all kinds of African musicians uh, playing instruments, singing, and it's been happening for a long time because, you know, people used to say, you know, when I was growing up, people used to, we would criticize each other on how our parents talk, you know, country people. But it took me a long time to realize that English really is my first language. The fact that I've mastered this, I mean, I studied Spanish too, but it's not my first language. So that, that, that my, I had my great grandmother could never call me Tommy, which is what they call me. She'd always call me Tony, you know, and because she didn't speak English. English was not her first language. And so and I, I realized that about my parents and what have you. And so just as our music, our music was not black music. And it was not black music mixed with, mixed with European music. It was African music, which has developed over historical time. And the best of it still has you and Miles Davis talking about having that thing. Mm. Uh, still have that thing in it that Miles talked about when he got him to me and finally had a, a, a bunch of black musicians. He said the sound was different mm. because they were all black. Mm -hmm. You know, Jimi Hendrix, mm. Band of Gypsies compared to the other. Mm. And so, uh, but the thing about African music though, Wherever African people are, whether they're in Brazil, Nicaragua, there are major black African musicians all over the world. In fact, there's no place you can go in the world where you will not find some black music, normally black classical music or Chinese food. 
That's very, very interesting. You can go all over the world. I've never been. Been in Syria, Muslim country. Woman playing jazz violin in the hotel. You know, so so this the the, the music, the the classical. Nate, I mean, I like the fact that we don't want to call jazz music black classical music because it is black music. Mm. But I think that all music that's played by African people is classical music. Mm. Mm. And whether whether it is Cecil Taylor or T Bone Walker, you know. And when you when you listen to a lot of African music and music of African people throughout the diaspora, you will hear a similarity. I mean, I, I mean, I listen to Bob Marley. Sometimes just listen to him play guitar. And I went to see him. I only saw him once. Saw him in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, he was uh, he was scatting at one point. I mean, he was dancing, and so this guy. But he but he also had the essence of what black classical music is, as what Kamal Cabral said. It is a product of history and the culture, and it is determined. It gives direction to what we should do. I mean, Dizzy Gillespie does a song called Manteca, which is a which is which is the Cuban influence. Uh, Dizzy, the uh, the Afro-Cuban music that we call in this country, Dizzy Gillespie was in Cab Calloway's band who's a trumpet player, Dizzy's trumpet player. And Mario Bowser was the other, the Cuban. He introduced Dizzy to Chano Pozo, who was the greatest Congo player to come out. And they asked Chano in an interview one time about Dizzy's and his music. He said, Dizzy no speak Spanish, I know speaking English, we both speak African. So that you can't take the African. No, you take that you can't take the African out of us. But as I said earlier, if you begin your history with slavery, uh, then you can take the African out. But that doesn't change anything. It just means that you don't understand what went down in the first place. Mm. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to. Uh, there's two, there's two things I wanted to I wanted to talk about or, or as we kind of come to a close. But I also wanted to invite people, uh, if they had a comment or a question, uh, to uh, to go right ahead and put that into the uh, question answer section. Or if you had a comment, put that into the chat. But what I wanted to talk about now is is when you when you talk about culture as being a determinant. Of course, Armacol Cabral is is looking at culture as a determinant and a and a, as a determinant of history. Right? Let's talk about Ornette Coleman, Farrell Saunders, Abby Lincoln, you know, Sun Ra, Archie Shep, David Mary, Max Roach. This freedom suite, this 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 music, and how when 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 they were engaged, how they were moving in content in rhythm with black freedom movements around the world could you talk a little bit about that it was interesting because in preparation for this talk i pulled out something which is an old freedom ways uh it's uh 1971 fall of 1971 and has an article in it called The Social Roots of African Amer- Afro-American Music by Thomas J. Porter. That was my, my first my, my first attempt at writing about the music. I would change some of the things that, but I talked about, I talked about uh, Max Roach, uh, the Freedom Now Suite, Sonny Rollins, Season Sweet, the, the, all of that music not only came out of the struggle, but it became a determinant of which way the struggle would go. So the, the, the thing about the movement in the 60s, it involved all segments of the black community and, and, and black, black power and the need for self-determination uh, just sped that process up. So you had uh, not only a uh, uh, black 
bookstores pick, picking up out all the place. And usually black bookstores sold music and art. They were, they were popping up all over the place. Uh, black people who wanted to design their own clothes, those were popping up all over the place. And places where I saw Coltrane in Cincinnati in a black club for five nights in a black club in the black neighborhood with Eric Dolphy. And so, you, I mean, and they were involved. Charlie Parker did a benefit for Benjamin Davis, who was a councilman in Harlem, who was a communist. John Coltrane did a lot of benefits. Miles Davis did a benefit for court. And so this, this relationship between the artists and the musicians, particularly the musicians, and the community has always been there, but because when there is a movement, then the music is involved in the music, and it's not only a reflection of the of, of, of the people, but it also gives direction of where the people should go. And so they were all part of the movement. What you saw in in the sixties, the late sixties and early seventies was. Black musicians really st starting their own record labels, but that wasn't nothing new. Dizzy Gillespie had a record label called DG. Uh, Mingus Max Roach had a record label called um, Debut. Um, so, but you also had organizations forming AAC, AACM out of Chicago. Bag out of St. Louis, the collected black artists out of New York. Um, I'm trying to think of Chicago, Chicago. Well, the AACM. Mm -hmm. I mean, I once I once asked Samir Baraka because he's an East Coaster, and uh, he had a problem for a while dealing with so-called free jazz, and so uh, I said, Amir, where do you think the center of black culture is in America?" He said Chicago. That's true. That's Sun Ra. That's the AACM. That's Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's Curtis Mayfield. That's Minnie Ripperton. You know, that's that's Hockey Ma Booty. That's Carol Rogers. I mean, you know, Chicago as a center of black culture. And so this interrelatedness with struggle. Because the musicians were facing the same thing that the rest of the black community was facing. You know, I talked to a well-known drummer and he told me recently that he used to play, I think it was Birdland, someplace he played every year. And he said, the owner said that he'd have to have somebody white in the band <laughs> in order for him to hire him. So the musicians were faced and the musicians come out of the black community. It's not like musicians came from some other kind of community. They came out of the community. In the early days, most of them came out of the church. And so, you know, people like to say that John Coltrane became spiritual. John was always sanctified. Both his grandfathers were AME pastors. He grew up in that. And you can hear it in his music. When you had, you know, like Max was a, uh, Max was always very political. Max Roach, uh, not only his Freedom Now Suite, but you also had the movies. I mean, one of the greatest black movies ever been made was Nothing But a Man with Abby Lincoln, who was married to Max and Ivan Dixon. I mean, so you had a whole, a whole lot of we, we like to talk about the black exploitation movie. We kind of like those movies because we always won, even though it was fictitious. But, uh, but, but there were also serious filmmakers and had been from the beginning of time, you know, that there was an industry. So this, this interrelatedness of the arts and the literature with the struggle has always been there. I wanted to, uh, uh, there was two questions I wanted to uh, weave into the conversation. The first question is, when is your book coming out? <laughs> and, the, and the second question, the second question is, uh, you know, uh, is, is culture the only determinant? And 
they follow up with this uh culture is a very is very small and as black people we get heard all over the world why don't we get the recognition that we deserve uh i guess to kind of weave that question into they they they're they're asking you know is culture the only determinant and if it is why don't we get the recognition you know i, I please take a stab at that I, i you know we can we can also restructure that question too. no we don't <laughs> have to we, we you know we don't have to do that mm-hmm. uh, cabral said that culture now when you talk about culture you're not just talking about music you're talking about the entire life of a community music being one it's 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 the food it's the dress it's the language it is the totality of the existence of a people and 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 the the oppressors understand the role of culture and they try to separate the people from their culture and you can see it all the time bob marley and and roots reggae had such an influence that that they had to replace it with something so they replaced it with dance hall which had absolutely nothing to do with what bob marley and the roots rock reggae nor with the history of music in jamaica when they moved rap to the west coast for the most part it's lost it lost its connection with the overall culture of black people it was not the same as public enemy and that was deliberate you can't have people talk about fight the power but it wasn't just public enemy talking about fight the power the azi brothers fight the power i mean uh curtis mayfield we are people who are darker than blue i mean the list goes on and on marvin gaye was a, this is the totality of your culture and to the degree that your culture represent comes out of your history and plays a role in telling you what you should do but culture is not a small thing it is the totality of the life of a community now it's not that our music and our culture is not recognized is that we don't recognize our culture as much as we do because if we did we wouldn't have stood for at the same time you got a black coach talking about discrimination in NFL and they had a bunch of west coast not progressive rappers i mean and and i'm not talking about whether they do good beats or what have you or they saying anything what are they reflection what are they determining that was deliberate just as they gave the previous half time to Jay-Z for undermining the thrust that Colin Kaepernick was making and that's always it's always a move they if you follow John Coltrane they did everything but call John Coltrane a child of god they said his music was anti-jazz it was ugly it was hateful and 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 what have you and if you ever listen to John a saw John Coltrane or Max I knew Max well spent a lot of time just talking with Max that uh that but we don't respect our culture I mean I've had two record stores and one of my side businesses is that I sell vinyl records and most of the records that I sell go to Europe go to Europe I'm talking about I mean I'm talking about black music. I'm talking about African music. You know, we've allowed ourselves to accept a small aspect of our culture to be the whole thing. And see, I don't think we have to prove it more than we can run fast, jump high, sing, or even play music. But to the degree that we're going to do those things, it should be an integral part of us trying to be free. Mm-hmm. And it is it is not that our music is not respected it's respected all over the world but we don't own it that's what we need to focus on is owning your music you see these people with Spotify one of these uh platforms and they're saying they don't want 
their music on that platform as long as this racist guy, Rogan, I think his name, is on there. There are, and most of these are white artists, but they are conscious enough to want to control their product. John Coltrane's last records were on Coltrane Records. He had his own label, you know, and so, but we have to respect our culture and we have to respect the totality of our culture. We can't, you know, as people say, well, I don't like reggae. Well, something wrong with you if you don't like Bob Marley. Something wrong with you. If you think that you into black culture, if you don't like Bob Marley, but it's, it's us who, who narrow. I remember my parents came to visit me and my father was into the blues and he played a harmonica. And uh, I had all the records that I used to listen to as a kid with him and I was playing them. And my mother kind of got jealous. And after I finished playing music for my father, I started playing all of the gospel and spiritual stuff that she used to listen to when I was growing up. Cause it was all in the same house, it was all part of our culture. But we separate ourselves. Uh, from our culture, appropriate a narrow piece of our culture and call it our culture. It didn't have anything to do with our culture. I hope I asked it. No, yeah, no, which actually led to a, a, another question from Louisa. Uh, who's actually in Malawi, uh, you know, it, it got to be very late in Malawi at this particular point. Um, where do you see culture and movements today? Well, to the degree that we have a movement, and, and I don't think we have a movement that is uni unified enough to really call it a movement today. I mean, uh, there was a clarity about the civil rights movement, a clarity in the sense that most people had a relation, a Southern relationship, even though they lived in New York, New York, they had a relationship with North and South Carolina. Uh, my, my family came out of Alabama, went to Chicago, Ohio, and Detroit, and what have you. And so, that one thing that we have to, I think, as a people, as we were talking about a black movement, I mean, how do we solve the problem of Africa still having to deal with imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism? How do we find ourselves in a position where we're fighting for the right to vote in 2022? That's because we don't have a common thrust. And to me, what is most important today is that for African people, wherever they are, is to unite in a pan-African sense uh, uh, and, 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 and by that, I mean pan-Africanism, uh, a la Du Bois, Pad Moore, and CLR James, mm. and 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 I think if we do that and start moving in that direction, the music not only will be reflective of that, but also will be a part of that. But right now, we we, we respond to events. When I listen to people on the radio, whatever the whatever the event is, we respond to it. Somebody did this. Somebody did that. We have to understand, which means you got to study. You got to study Pan Africanism. You got to study the history. Uh, and and you know, as I was repairing for this, the other book, I was. <laughs> this is Cabral's Return to the Source, but I had a stack of books that I would that I've been reading anyhow. Uh, uh, Cedric is it Cedric Moore? out of uh, Cedric off the West Coast. Robinson. Cedric Robinson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hadn't read his stuff. And uh, I'm close, but I, but, I, but I read other stuff too. Uh, and uh, I watch the news from all over, and I listen to music from all over the world. And if it's progressive, I don't give a damn whether it's from India, 
Sri Lanka, Nicaragua, or Venezuela, then it's all right with me. So, uh, but we don't have uh, anything. We don't have a unified move. We don't want to have. We don't have a common goal and objectives, you know. And then we allow uh, some sideshow, and I'm not going to get into that. But things that are the side show, and we let it become an integral part of, 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 of where we are. I mean, the central contradiction between black people of African people and capitalism is not our sexual orientation. Now that's important, but I have to deal with this chair because I had operations on two of my knees. So, and, you know, we get caught up. I mean, it's not that these things are not important, but the central contradiction that people face is between capitalism and their lives. And to the degree, if you don't want to fight that, if you don't want to change that, then how important is your struggle? And if everybody got a chance to do what they wanted to do, and we were still in capitalism, we still have the same problems. No, I, I mean, I got a play that I'm working on. It's called a concentration camp. And uh, it's concentration camp, modern concentration camp. So when they check you in before they, where they warehouse you before you go to the, the ovens, they ask you, Mr. Porter, uh, how would you, what would you like your cell to look like? Well, I'm Afrocentric. They give you some mud cloth and what have you. You say, well, I want a hip hop version. They give you that, but guess what? All of you still in the concentration camp. No, that's a, that's a very <laughs> lot to say. <laughs> it's a lot to say about that, but we, we're getting ready to wrap up. But I wanted to, I wanted to, I, I, I have to uh, really uh, ask you about the role of radio, the role of radio uh, in movement um, in uh, the rhythms of, of Black freedom, uh, the promotion and engagement with uh, with Africa as a concept and an idea. Because again, you 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 were the program director at a, at a radio station, WPFW in Washington, D.C., but also you had a program on that really for, you know, set the model to how I engage in radio as well. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, there's other people who have that, but talk about the role of radio because there is a revolutionary tool. It is a revolutionary radical tool that has had. Fanon talked about this in the dying uh, 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 colonialism. He, uh, he talks about the role of radio in movement. Talk about that and we will end it from there. Well, historically, radio has been an important medium in, in the Black community. I mean, we didn't see Joe Lewis fight. We heard Joe Lewis fight on the radio. And so the radio has always been an important and still is, particularly among what we call the third world or people call the third world, but, but in Africa, Latin America, the radio is very, very important uh, to, and people still listen to the radio and and it will always be important because, I mean, you can go in any city and there's a radio station that might be owned, might not be owned by black people, but it's aimed at black people, you know? And, uh, uh, and, and a radio station like WPFW, the a radio station that, not, now, because it is a radio station, it's not necessarily progressive, but one of the things that most radio stations do uh, they stay, they go up to a certain line in the culture, you know. Uh, if they do talk, they're going to stay at a certain, WPFW is a rarity to the degree that you have uh, of, uh, radical thinking and progressive thinking, people who can be heard. But I think radio it's always been, Dr. King talked about the importance of radio and the importance of, of, uh, of uh, radio personalities in the struggle. And I think that 
a significant number of people in the in the black community in this country and around the world still listen to the radio. There was there was an article that just came out. I think it was uh, maybe last last week that talked about that talked about the role of radio uh, on the on the continent of Africa and how it is a still uh, how it is still an important tool for uh, for mass uh, uh, reaching the masses of people and, and consciousness raising, you know, and those types of things. Of course, we know Finon. You know, of course, we got Radio Free D- Dixie with Robert F. Williams out of North Carolina. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Radio Free Algeria. There, so radio has always been one of those particular components and tools uh, that uh, Black folk. Let's end with this question, and, and try. And I don't even know if I should ask you this question because we may be up here for another, another, another hour or so. What does Cole Char- What does John Coltrane mean to you? And because I saw him. I saw John Coltrane more than I saw any other musician in my life. But the first time I heard John Coltrane, and I was listening to Black classical music. This was in high school. I was I had a membership to the Columbia Record Club, and I was working in a 30-minute dry cleaners. And there was a radio, going back to the radio, Frankie Allison in Cincinnati had a jazz program on the station on Sunday morning. And I was working in dry cleaners and I heard this sound. And Cecil, who was a presser in the dry cleaners, I said, Cecil, who is that? He said, man, that's Train. And I, man, I had never, I had never heard John Coltrane. Now, and I had records of my own. I mean, even though I was in high school, I'd heard a lot of musicians, but I'd never heard um, John Coltrane consolidated in his time in which he lived everything of substance and progressive and all of the music that had gone before him. Now, he wasn't by himself, you know, but he was a leader. Uh, And I mean, to me, I mean, it's hard because it's, I just I just heard him and saw him so many times, and I've listened um, every year. I do a month uh, uh, from John Coltrane's birthday and thirty days out. Sometimes I do it thirty days before. I listen to nothing but John Coltrane every day, and each year as I listen to John Coltrane, I hear something new. You no, know, because he said that he said that, you know, John was a very simple guy. He said that there's a lot of uh, forces in the world for bad that he wanted to be a force that was truly for good. And you read interviews, listen to interviews with John Coltrane, somebody asked him about the Vietnam War. And John said, I think all wars should stop. I mean, when he went to Japan, he went to visit the Hiroshima Memorial in Nagasaki. And so John embodied everything that was going on that he had seen uh, in his life. And uh, whether it was the spiritual, whether it was the gospel, whether it was the R&B, or whether it was India, or Brasilia, I mean, that was the tradition of of our music, was to not only take our music to the world, but bring the world to us. And John Coltrane did that, I mean, and uh, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about John Coltrane. Well, that's not true, some of the critics, but I have never, more importantly, I've never read or heard John Coltrane say anything bad about another musician. 
And that, and that's 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 important. And um, of course, uh, you know, Alice Coltrane and her influences on John Coltrane were immense as well, taking him, you know, uh, it, it can be said, or would you say that, you know, her influence on John Coltrane was 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 just as or probably uh, uh, important because he also found a kindred spirit. Uh, oh, I, I think I think that's the key. Uh, and Alice, I thought john found a a kendrick spirit but when because alice was a pianist she was one of three major female artists to come out of detroit dorothy ashby terry pollard and alice mcleod which is her maiden name they were three and you can listen to alice play before she met Coltrane. And I don't know what Coltrane, I mean, I, I can't tell you what the chemistry was, but the story is that he was following her around the club <laughs> one night playing his horn. So, uh, but their relationship changed both of them. And Train was at a point in his development where he was uh, becoming more cosmic. At the same time, he was coming deeply more spiritual. I mean, as he said, he was uh, searching for his roots. But, you know, uh, I think they changed each other. And certainly all the musicians that Coltrane played with, Pharaoh Saunders, I mean, Coltrane had great big arms and with all of the young musicians who came up, he would let them play. He'd let them play, whether it was Archie, Albert Isla, he would let them play, you know? No, I, I want to thank you immensely for spending, you know, uh, uh, an hour, uh, over an hour with us tonight. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. Thank you for, you know, just being able, you know, being having big arms as well, because you know, you, you, you're in that tradition of community, you're in that tradition of kind of Coltrane to kind of wrap your arms around folk who are attempting to uh, to, to make a change and living to make a change. And, you know, uh, and we do definitely appreciate that. Uh, with that being said, thank you. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will be able to have another conversation again. Well, thank you for having me. And I, and I certainly uh, am glad I've had the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I never, I mean, what I know does not belong to me. Right. What I know is a result of people and all of the teachers and all of the people who came before me, older men and women, who basically said certain things, helped me along the way. And uh, I would be guilty of the imperialism of knowledge if I kept this to myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm always great to have an opportunity. And again, thank you very much. We'll, we'll be we'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you. Y apostrophe S W I S E Africa 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 Mighty Ancient Beautiful Africa creator of the human being, of speech, of music, of the dance, ancient, mighty Africa, beautiful Africa. But when you put your hand on your sister, made her a slave, watch out, Africa. Watch out, Africa, the ghost's gonna get you. When you put your hand on your brother, made him a slave, watch out, Africa. Watch out, Africa. The ghost gonna get you. Ah! How did I get here on my back in the dark with the wind and water blowing through my ears? How did I get here in the dark? How did I get here in the dark with the wind and water blowing through my ears? Watch out, Obatala, Shango, save me. Save me, Isa, save me. How did I get on my back in the dark with the wind and water blowing through my ears? My brother, the king, sold me to the ghosts. 
My brother the king sold me to the ghost. At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a railroad made of human bones. At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a railroad made of human bones. Black ivory. Black ivory. Wise one. If you ever find yourself somewhere lost and surrounded by enemies who won't let you speak in your own language, who destroy your statues and instruments, who ban your um boom ba um, you're in trouble. They ban your um boom ba boom. You in deep, deep trouble. Huh. Probably take you several hundred years to get out. At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a railroad made of human bones. Black ivory, black ivory, black ivory. 